there's four deaths. They're connected. That's all I know that much I learned. And that's all I want to know. I'm just trying to circle the wagons here, John. Circle the wagons? What do you who do you think you are? Some gumshoe and a dime novel? Loose cannoning around the city? Con Al Pacino is the mayor of New York City, and the death of a child threatens to tear the town apart in City Hall. One of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, including a comedy with Adam Sandler as a goofy golfer, and an upcoming film about the war between David Letterman and Jay Leno. And we'll also take a look at what's missing on the just-announced Oscar list. I'm Gene Siskel with the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is City Hall, and it stars Al Pacino and John Cusack in convincing and interestingly textured performances as the mayor of New York City and the young man from Louisiana who is his deputy. As the movie opens, an off-duty detective has gotten involved in a shootout with the nephew of a mafia boss. Both are killed along with a six-year-old boy caught in the crossfire. The mayor ignores his deputy's advice and insists on speaking at the child's funeral. To make a better place to live. Is that too much to ask? Are we asking too much for you? Is it beyond our reach? Because if it is, then we are nothing but sheep being herded to the final slaughterhouse. Another key character is the political boss of Brooklyn, played by Danny Aiello. Here he has a secret meeting with the mafioso boss, played by Tony Franciosa. The idea is to frame the dead cop. You ever heard of a cop with $40,000? Yeah. Who wasn't crooked? No. The mayor and the Brooklyn boss are close, too, and have been horse trading on a new construction project. Just because this kid thinks he can elect your president, you're going to forget who got you here? I don't forget anything. You're developing a short memory, Frank, or a very selective one. You want me to refresh it for you? Cusack suspects some kind of a shady deal has been made, maybe involving the mayor. Pacino tries to deal with his charges. He's a man who can see a broad area between right and wrong. There's black and there's white. And in between is mostly gray. That's us. Now, gray is a tough color because it's not as simple as black and white. And for the media, certainly not as interesting. But it's who we are. The good things in City Hall are so very good that it's a shame the whole movie just doesn't live up to them. I admired most of the performances, and I liked a lot of the dialogue, which is colorful and literate. But there are a couple of big flaws, one being the lawyer for the dead detective's family, played by Bridget Fonda. Her character and plot line are not at all necessary, and they drag the movie down. Another is that the movie falls in love with the Pacino character, and so it fudges on him at the end. They're just afraid to make him look like a really bad guy. And the third really unforgivable element is a cornball closing scene showing young Cusack running for office. It plays for all the world as if somebody got cold feet and decided to tack on a phony happy ending. Roger, I had the same reaction to the picture. There are three of the finest screenwriters in Hollywood listed in the credits for this picture, and that's a warning sign. Nick Pileggi, Bo Goldman, and Paul Schrader. Uh -huh. That means you're going to get a picture with a lot of great dialogue. Uh -huh. But these guys are used to writing their own pictures, uh -huh. and that means they didn't have a convincing storyline. It's all cobbled together, thrown together. And you know, uncredited is Frank Pearson, who came yeah. in and rewrote the whole thing later, and he's also they one don't of the have best. A straight narrative too, many, line. too many people being thrown at the same problem. Yeah, it does doesn't work. Okay, next movie, and it's already been making headlines. It's called The Late Shift, the new made-for-cable movie about the big money, bigger ego battle between David Letterman and Jay Leno for the succession to the throne of Johnny Carson. And although the advance word on this picture, some gossiping has been less than thrilling, wow, I enjoyed this picture a lot, in much the same way I enjoyed Bill Carter's wonderful book upon which it was based. Here's an example, as David Letterman is informed by his NBC bosses that Jay Leno and not Letterman will inherit The Tonight Show. To appreciate the scene, try to get past the fact that the actor playing Letterman, John Michael Higgins, with his red hair, looks as much like Jerry Springer as Dave. Now, the best thing would have been for all of us here to have uh, gone on and have done The Tonight Show. That's what we always wanted to do. And it's a real disappointment that we're not. But if it is your final decision, uh, then you can contact my lawyer. Letterman agrees to get an agent, and not just any agent. He meets with Michael Ovitz, at the time head of CAA, and not considered just an agent, but the most powerful deal maker in Hollywood. Ovitz is played by Treat Williams. Dave will be offered an 1130 show, and he will be offered it by every network. The geometry of the deal will be far larger. 
the studios will be in, the syndicators, the full range of the entertainment industry. We shall frame a deal that will make you one of the giants. Daniel Roebuck plays Jay Leno, who early in the film is portrayed as sort of a loyal lapdog. He is not being well served by his fiery executive producer and manager, Helen Kushnick, played furiously by Oscar winner Kathy Bates. She goes ballistic when President Reagan's speech at the Republican convention threatens to delay a live broadcast of The Tonight Show. There's only one person who can take me off the air, Bob Wright. I'll give you his number. Call him. I don't need to call Bob. Right. I'll send my audience home, and then you can call them and explain why the Tonight Show wasn't on the air because the news poll couldn't get a horse speech off on time. Kushnick, who is one of the villains of the movie, causes more trouble for Leno when she begins blackballing Tonight Show guests who want to appear on other late night shows. Leno gets bad press for it and an ultimatum from NBC dump her or he'll be fired. You sat there on Jerry's deathbed. You said, I'll take care of your wife and daughter. I heard you say that. Yeah, I did say that. I did say that. You know what? And I meant it then. But now, I mean, you know, you're, Helen, you almost cost me this job. My favorite show on all of TV, even more than this one, Roger, is the Larry Sanders show, which is a biting parody of late night talk shows. Well, there are parts, a lot of parts, of the late shift that can hold their own with the best of the Larry Sanders show. The late shift will be broadcast on HBO beginning next weekend and I do recommend it. I don't recommend it, Gene. I was wow. kind of disappointed. And first of all, this movie makes absolutely no attempt to show you what, what makes these people really tick. It's all oh. surface. No, it it's isn't. It's just kind of a one-over summary of the book, the events in the book. Another problem? I know. The, of course it shows you what makes you tick. You have two... You have David Letterman wants to be Johnny Carson. Jay Leno is a Everybody hard charger. Everybody knew that before they saw the movie. I wanted more see. from the movie. I wanted emotions. I wanted inside. Oh, there's emotional The best throughout. performance in this movie is definitely by Kathy, Kathy Bates. Bates as Helen Kushnick. And there's something wrong when she upstages and is much more interesting than even the, either the David Letterman or the Jay Leno characters. Those actors, because neither you, one of them is convincing. Neither one of them is effective. Yeah. Neither one of them... You, yeah. By the end of the movie... Now, when I saw Nixon... Within 15 minutes, I believe that Anthony Hopkins was Nixon. By the end of this movie, I still thought I was looking at a Saturday Night Live sketch. Neither one of those guys came close. The reason why you, the reason why, those the reason why you're so interested in Kushnick is Kushnick is someone you and I have never met and didn't oh, know. Oh, we did. We both met her backstage at the Leno show the first week. The show was on we, the air. Uh, we don't met her in, in a surface way. We really don't know her, and that's why it's no, new but information. I'm, say, I'm, I'm saying the performance. The performance shows the She's emotions a that's going on. She's here. a better actor she than they is, are. And the others are not very Roger, good. this is pretty compelling television, I think. When we come back, Adam Sandler plays a weirdo golfer named Happy Gilmore. 22 minutes, 16 seconds past the hour. Nice guy, James. His name's William. A familiar face, a morning smile, an extra step. Put his down, but he got here anyway, didn't he? Smiles. At this moment, the people of FedEx are using their know-how, determination, and heart to treat your package as if it were the most important package of all. Because to them, that's exactly what it is. James, such a nice boy. He is a nice boy, but his name's William. Yum. Oh, the taste of lime. Ta -la -la -la. Yum. Ta -la -la -la. Orange. Yum. Ta -la -la -la. Wild. I was Steve's den mother for three years. He was one of my more active scouts. Always scrambling around the meetings, diving over furniture, under furniture. Never stopped moving. All the kids chasing him. Running, 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 running. He didn't pick up anything he didn't try and throw. Still, he was a leader, had a lot of character. I always knew Steve was going to amount to something. As soon as he learned to sit still. <laughs> Winter weather can be beautiful. It can be fun. It can be dangerous. But Storm Team 10 can't be beat for Southern New England's most comprehensive coverage of winter snow, cold, and ice. Storm Team 10, the only team bringing you the best of News Channel 10 and Light 105, providing blanket coverage when snow blankets the ground. So this way, turn to the team with the experience to help you weather the storm. Turn to Storm Team 10, sponsored in part by Off-Track Betting and Lance Buick Pontiac Cadillac. Oops. 
A guy who really wants to be a hockey player discovers he has a great golf long shot in Happy Gilmore, a new comedy starring Adam Sandler. The movie's plot is basically about how Happy is a nice guy who loves his grandmother and smashes in the face of anyone who gets in his way. One of the few who believe in him is a former pro played by Carl Weathers who becomes his coach. It's all Get off of me. He's just easing the tension, baby. Just easing the tension. Well, ease it on someone else. In a pro-am tournament, Bob Barker turns up and grows impatient with Happy's uneven playing. There is no way that you could have been as bad at hockey as you are at golf. All right, let's go. Oh! You like that, old man? You want a piece of me? I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing. One of the problems I have with Happy Gilmore is that Happy didn't seem very happy. He kept beating people up, throwing tantrums, and tossing people through windows. In fact, he was only marginally better than the bad guys, and a lot more homicidal. Another distraction was the movie Shameless Product Placement. I counted no less than eight, eight mentions of Subway sandwich shops, including a scene where Happy appears in a Subway commercial in this movie. If you have faith in a movie, as the makers of the film, you ought to want to make your money at the box office instead of selling commercial space right in the middle of the plot. Well, I liked it a little bit better than you in this sense, that I think that Adam Sandler has a decent movie in him. I think that uh, unlike, let's say, Pauly Shore or Chris Farley, who I find totally annoying, mm -hmm. as I watched this guy, I was reminded of frankly, just how good Bill Murray would have been in this yeah. role. I mean, it's a Caddyshack wannabe is what this picture is. But Adam Sandler has a sweetness there, and I think he's making a mistake if he's going to play a mean guy. I think you ought to look at some of Bill Murray's work and see that there's a sweetness that can energize yeah, well, a picture. Well, the, the writing in the movie is all wrong in terms of it's making him such a violent and angry person. It's not necessary. But you know, you're hard on Chris Farley, too, and you were last week, and I never got to get back to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's the writers that these guys are at the mercy of. I think Chris Farley can be very funny with the right material. Uh, uh, which, he has been on Saturday Night Live. Which, uh, well, we're not talking about that now, but which movie have you seen him in that was good? I haven't seen a movie that I liked him in, but that's doesn't make him bad. Me either. Me either. Doesn't make him bad. Me either. Coming up next, the surprises in this year's Oscar nomination list. We'll try to explain some unexpected inclusions and exclusions when we come back. Here are some tips that will help you weather the winter by using hot water wisely and efficiently. Always keep the area around your furnace and water heater clean and well ventilated. Try to keep your water heater at a temperature setting of 120 Fahrenheit. Repair leaky hot water faucets and pipes. Install water flow restrictors in your shower heads and other faucets. Use cold water when little water is required. You can also help your neighbors weather the winter by giving to the Good Neighbor Energy Fund. Just look for this envelope in your next utility bill. Are you in an abusive relationship? You might think hiding will heal it, but the only one you're fooling is yourself. Stop pretending it won't happen again, because no matter how strong you think you are, you'll end up very weak. I don't know everything about relationships, but I do know that if somebody's hurting you, it's time to get out and get help. My Ideal Show takes your breath away and gets you on your feet and moves you around and brings hands together and minds together and lives together because it's just going to start way up here and keep going up and up and your heartbeat and your pulse are going to be going with it until you say, girl, I got to take me a rest or I'm going to fall right over. Turn to 10 for Oprah weekdays at 4. That's okay. That's why we have commercial breaks. <laughs> The nominations for the 68th annual Oscars were announced earlier this week, and there were lots of surprises. We'll try to explain them, starting with the surprises of exclusion, films and performances that were not nominated. I was stunned and very disappointed that two superb, serious-minded pictures, Leaving Las Vegas and Dead Man Walking, were not nominated as Best Picture. We both know I'm a drunk. And I know you're a hooker. Why is you a nun? I was drawn to it, I guess. I mean, that's a hard question to answer. It's like asking you why you're a convict. The vast majority of the Academy members, the producers, the publicists, the craft workers, apparently didn't care enough to see these films about a suicidal drunk and a man on death row as lighter fare carried the day in the best picture category. 
You know, you're right about that, Gene. It is a disappointment because these two movies are the best that Hollywood can do. They represent the very top. I think so. The very top of the craft. And the fact is, the voters in the Academy, and we know this because we've seen it happen every year, care more about the business than they care about the what art you, form and about the... What do you the, think of my, my surmise that they didn't oh, screen I'm the sure. picture? I'm sure they didn't. And, of course, when, when, when two movies get that much acclaim when they win so many they critics have an awards i think they have an obligation you got to see it. them and they didn't do their job you got it this was certainly a year when some of the big year-end entries got surprisingly overlooked at oscar time when the american president came out last november it was widely expected to get a lot of nominations especially in the acting categories but it got completely shut out except for the original musical score maybe its liberal slant was a handicap in an election year at 20 percent we're 34 votes shy in the house it can't be done Another movie that got in political hot water was Oliver Stone's Nixon, which won acting nominations for exactly. Anthony Hopkins and Joan Allen, but got shut out of the Best Picture and Directing categories, not to mention editing, where it was brilliant. Another major oversight, both Nixon and Casino were photographed by Robert Richardson, who wasn't nominated for either one. Were there two better cinematography performances all year? I don't think so. Well, that was great work. I think the issue on the American president may be this, and it's historical with the Academy. Romantic comedies are not rewarded. It is an art form that is not valued. I think that's been true for 68 years at the Academy. Cary Grant. Cary Grant never won an Oscar because Correct. everybody said, oh, it's easy to do that, and they're wrong. It, very wrong. Another surprise omission on the list, Ron Howard, amazingly not nominated by the director's branch. Maybe Ron Howard did too good of a job in Apollo 13. Maybe the directors didn't realize the film doesn't contain a single frame of stock footage, either from network TV news or from NASA's archives. Even this amazing rocket launch was created by a special effects crew chosen by Ron Howard. Maybe Ron Howard is just too commercially successful as a director, and his colleagues are jealous, but I really think he was robbed. I don't see how you can give it nine nominations. He was robbed, and you know, why was Michael Radford nominated for The Postman? It's a very nice picture. And I, you know, it I was moved by it. But, I mean, when you compare what was really done in terms Into of direction. direction. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it wasn't fair. Almost all of the pre-Oscar speculation assumed that John Travolta would be nominated in the Best Actor category for Get Shorty. Why wasn't Travolta nominated? Well, maybe because the picture was about Hollywood. And the movie business sometimes gets uneasy about depictions of itself. Or maybe he was squeezed out by the sentimental vote for Massimo Troisi in The Postman, whose death right after finishing the picture touched a lot of people. I'll give you another reason. I think that Travolta may have suffered by comparison to his work in Pulp Fiction, and I think that this role plays a little bit like Pulp Fiction light. Mm -hmm. And so, really, I don't, I cannot blame the actors branch in this instance for not nominating. I think there were five better performances okay. than his. Okay, you may be right. When we come back, more Oscar surprises, this time some unexpected inclusions, including a cute little pig. Good heaven. Who are you? Hey. Honey, look, it's her. That lady from the Sprint commercial is about 10 cents a minute. Huh. Hi, how are you? I just love your dime a minute rate. Oh, isn't that nice? Me too. It's good anywhere in the country. And now I hear you can call all the way to Canada for a dime. Canada? Really? Oh, look at that. Special on paper towels. Dime to Canada? That's bigger news than anything you'll find in there. This? Oh, this isn't mine. Blech. Call now to get 10 cents a minute across the U.S. and now even to Canada. Once upon a time, there was a king. This is the last year that I'm doing The Tonight Show. His loyal subjects. Flip a coin, Jay, Dave, Dave, Jay, it doesn't matter to them. How could a television show be worth this much embarrassment? A fairy godfather. We shall frame a deal that will make you one of the giants. The queen mother of all managers. See, I don't have a contract with you. I can move oh. Jay to CBS within a month. HBO Pictures comes clean about late night TV's dirtiest fight. The Late Shift, coming this month, only on HBO. Continuing our survey of this year's biggest Oscar surprises, when the Oscar nominations were announced this week, no films caused a bigger stir than Babe, which got seven nominations, and The Postman, which got five. More importantly, they placed in the top categories, picture, acting, direction, and screenplay. In the case of Babe, which was a real underhog, <clears throat> this was the little family film from Australia, which upset Toy Story, the year's top grossing film. So I go through the kitchen, across the living room. Good, good, good. good. Into the bedroom. Yeah. Get the mechanical roaster. Yep. And bring it out to you. What about the cat? Uh, and quietly bring it out to you. The groundswell for The Postman was due to two things. First, sentiment over the death of its star, Massimo Troisi, who knew he was sick but kept on working and died 12 hours after completing his last scene. 
And the second reason for the Postman's strong showing, a well-run Oscar campaign by Miramax Films, which spent a reported $1.5 million to send cassettes to all Academy members and to buy lots and lots of trade ads. The ads obviously inspired the voters to look at the movie over the holiday season. It was fresh in their minds when they marked their ballots. When they asked, do those Oscar campaigns ever make a difference? The answer is, they sure do. Oh, it was a brilliant ad campaign, including, I thought, a masterstroke of having a bunch of novelists come out and support this picture. Obviously, uh -huh. Miramax got to them and solicited their opinion. And uh, here are these great writers. Most of the actors never finished college and out there. So they're saying, well, if they liked it, it's okay for me to vote for it for best picture. It was a masterful yeah. ad campaign, one of the greatest in history. And you well, bet Oscar nominations can be bought. Now my choice for a surprise inclusion. I was caught by surprise that Braveheart led all films with 10 nominations. I thought Apollo 13 would lead, but Braveheart is also the kind of big epic scale production that gets plenty of nominations in many technical craft categories like editing, sound, and costume. Also, let's face it, Braveheart was surprisingly good as Mel Gibson breathed new life into the medieval sword fight drama. He received two nominations himself as best director and for producing the best picture. There is first nominations. He did a very good job. It was a very good film. And, you know, another uh, sort of uh, play movie that came Rob out about Roy. the same time, Rob Roy, was good. And I thought the Academy did a great job of reaching all the way back to last spring Tim and Roth. noticing that Tim Roth this is was so good in that supporting performance in Rob Roy, which had the best sword fight I've ever seen Me on too. the screen. And I'll tell you, we've said this before, but it is the villain that always energizes and makes successful an action picture. And Tim Roth is one of the best villains we've seen in the movies in a long time. Okay, if I was forced to choose a single nomination that gave me more pleasure than any other, I think I'd choose James Cromwell's nomination for Best Supporting Actor in Babe. Away to me, pig! Remember, you have to dominate them. Do that and they'll do anything you want. Go, go! This was not your typical family movie with simplistic speeches and slam-bang plot developments. It was a remarkably subtle comedy about believing in yourself and getting along with those who aren't like you. Cromwell's performance brought it the seriousness and gravity that it needed. Well, do you remember, Roger, on our member of the Academy show where we try and influence? Yes. Uh, last month, we try and influence. Do you remember who was the one who pushed for? Do you think you influenced the Academy? I don't know. What do you think? Wouldn't hurt. You got okay. it, guy. <laughs> one more surprise inclusion for me, and it's a good choice. Mayor Winningham nominated as Best Supporting Actress for playing the title character in Georgia. She portrayed a famous folk singer, the older, more responsible sister to the flashier, bigger role of the self-destructive wannabe singer played by Jennifer Jason Lee. You were the one with the ambition, Sadie. I never gave a damn, you say. It's very rare that the more solid character in a two-character story gets Oscar recognition. Congratulations to the Actors Branch for acknowledging Mayor Winningham's fine, well-modulated performance. I love mm -hmm. when actors reach out and find the even tone. Mm -hmm. I like Jennifer Jason Lee very much in the movie, too. You can't get everything, though, and I'm glad that at least this movie was singled out because it was a, good uh, story. a movie that had a lot of good acting in it. When we come back, we'll take another look at the new movies we reviewed on this show. Hello, Marco. Madame? Marco. Hello, Marco. Smart Pop. 94% fat free. Hello, Marco. 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 100% carefree. Smart Pop. From Orville Redenbacher. If it's Saturday night, it's steak night. That's just the way it's always been. And I always use my favorite steak sauce. It's tradition. Excuse me? What? Sometimes I'm in the mood for something different. Something rich. Robust. Something zesty. Hearty. Delicious. It's there. And it's great. Mm. A steak sauce for me? Are you serious? Can you do that? Yeah. All right. Mm. New A1 Thick and Hearty. Steak has never been done like this before. Sonia and Barney went everywhere together. Down, down the garden, up the garden. Up, up the, the stairs, garden. down the stairs. When Sonia took things out of her cupboard, Barney, Barney got in her cupboard. If you like when to Sonia read, here's a story you'll love. I'm Patrice Wood. It's time again for the MS Readathon. Just by reading lots of great books, you'll be helping to raise money to fight multiple sclerosis. Besides, there are some great prizes, too. So turn to 10 for this year's MS Readathon. And they lived happily ever after. Amnesia? Last time oh. on Pueblo 81009. Marco. 
Remember using the spree catalog to send for the spree in low-cost government publications on saving money, getting federal benefits, staying healthy, and the catalog is free. Free? Free? Information on educating our children? Send your name and address to New Catalog, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Don't forget, like Marco. Marco? Who's Marco? Oh. The Century Plaza, offering the finest in luxury service in Southern California style, adjacent to Beverly Hills on L.A.'s fashionable west side. The Century Plaza Hotel and Tower, a Westin hotel. Returning to the new movies on this show that we reviewed, let's take another look at all three. Two thumbs down on City Hall, starring Al Pacino as a powerful New York mayor suspected of corruption by his deputy John Cusack. The film's good writing is overshadowed by too many essential flaws in its story construction. A split vote on The Late Ship, the story of the network talk show wars between David Letterman and Jay Leno. It airs on HBO beginning next week. And finally, two thumbs down for Happy Gilmore, the Adam Sandler comedy about a would-be hockey player who finds his true vocation as a manic golfer. Adam Sandler has a better movie in him. Go make it. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Before and After, starring Meryl Streep and Liam Neeson as parents whose lives are turned upside down when their teenage son is accused of murder. And also Mary Riley, starring Julia Roberts and John Malkovich in the story of a young maid who works in the household of Dr. Jekyll and his assistant, a certain Mr. Hyde. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. The Libman Wonder Mop takes the mess out of mopping. Just slide the ringer sleeve down and twist. With the Libman